Welcome to Inside the Hype.tv podcast, the show that takes you into the world of bees. I'm Dr. Umberto Bon Cristiani. In today's episode, I speak with Dr. Oliver Ruppel, a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Alberta in Canada. We talked about his career working with social insects and also discussed his latest research publication on honeybees. The publication reveals that varroa mites, an important pest of honeybees, feed differently depending on the life stage of the parasitized honeybee. This discovery is significant as it greatly enhances our understanding of the life cycle of this important honeybee pest, which causes significant damage to the beekeeping industry. I want to thank our Academy members for their support and you for watching. Hello everybody! Welcome to the show. It is with great pleasure that today I have my great friend, my mentor, a guy that I have a huge respect, Dr. Olive Ruppel. Welcome to the show, Olive. How are you? Hi, Roberto. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me to speak on your, on your show. That was, uh, this is something supposed to be happening a long time ago, but we never had the opportunity. And I think now with this new publication that just came up a week ago, I think was the perfect fit for, for you to come in and share a little bit about yourself and this incredible research that you and your team now in Canada put together is an impressive body, a body of work. Before we jump into the, the presentation itself, Olaf, and it's a tradition here. I ask about how you get into the bees. If you can give me a little overview about how you get into the bees and your background. Yeah, so I um, grew up in Germany and my father was a, bi was a biologist. So I always knew that I wanted to do biology um, because he showed me what a fascinating life that could be and, and how good, you know, it is to pursue your passion and play around basically and learn about life. And never stop being a child, so to speak, and asking questions. And so I wanted to be a biologist and a scientist so that I could ask questions and answer questions. Wanted to study birds, really. That's what I started university with, the desire to study birds. And then it took my mentor, Professor Heldobler, and his animal behavior class that I took as a very fresh student to fascinate me about the world of insects, and specifically social insects. Social insects are the ants, the wasps, the bees, and the termites mostly. And Professor Haldobler was an ant specialist. And a large part of that animal behavior class was all about ants because for every question, there was an answer in the ants. And so he, he did manage to fascinate me about the social intricacies of group living and colony living. And so I, I started working for my master's and my PhD at the University of Würzburg on a queen size dimorphism. So ants have, just like honeybees, queen and many sterile workers uh, in a colony. There are 10,000 different species of ants and there's lots of different varieties of biodiversity in, in, in those species. I was particularly interested in ants that have different sizes of queens. And so that's how I got started with social insects. After my PhD at the University of Würzburg in the year 2000, I decided that I needed to study a model social organism. And the model social organism is the honeybee because the honeybee is obviously really important um, commercially and ecologically and a study system for a lot of different kinds of questions as well. Very well researched. And the honeybee genome was also sort of peaking over the horizon in the year 2000, even though it was only going to be published in 2006. So I thought I would learn and study the honeybee as a postdoctoral researcher. And that was at the University of Davis in California with Professor Page, Robert Page, that many of you probably know. And I stayed there for two and a half years. And got my training, got everything that I wanted. And then the plan st still didn't work out to return to Germany and to the ants. Because in the meantime, I got married to a Canadian uh, biologist and we looked for two jobs in the world. And it happened to be North Carolina at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro, where we could both be uh, starting our independent research careers in biology. I found that there were so many questions about honeybees that I stayed largely with the honeybees up to this point. UNCG was our home for 17 years, uh, and I built my career and my group there, including 
hosting you for a few years there uh, for a wonderful research project. But then we were called up to uh, the University of Alberta here in uh, the year 2020, or I was moving in 2020. And now I have my group here where it just snowed again. So greetings to Colorado, Florida or wherever you are. But yes, we just had a, a fresh layer of snow and the season is a lot shorter. But the honeybees are still a lot, very productive. Great beekeeping community here yeah, up in, in the north. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy, very happy to be here at the University of Alberta and still researching many questions in honeybees. And you are working hard indeed. There is several publications of you. It is in my to-do list to make videos about. So this year, probably you're going to see your group much, a lot of highlights of your research here in the Inside the Hive TV. And yeah, a, a lot of work. My work that I have such a good time with you. I learned from you a lot about science and how to conduct yourself ethical, ethically specifically, how to do good sciences. And, uh, and I want to say thank you in front of the world. You, you teach me a lot. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I do think, you know, independent academics are really important because our salary doesn't depend on a, a research outcome or a finding. And so we, we really need to be that independent judge that, that does, um, you know, the evaluation of whatever is in front of us, a question in an objective manner. And that's why tenure is so important. And I hear that Florida has just given uh, up on that principle of tenure. And that's, that's just a horrific. Um, it's scary. Uh, it is scary. Uh, yeah, it's two, two different words. I think it's, there is a book from Professor uh, what's his name? I forgot his name. It's a conflict of vision. That's the title. And some people, there is pros and cons in almost everything. And some, sometimes there is those collisions of ideas. I think Florida is in this blue and black and white, blue and green and red. You know, there, was, there is a big conflict now. And I think we need to go back to the center. But that's my personal opinion. Olaf, let me give you a little background before we jump into the, this new research that you just published. Right, because here uh, I have my members of the academy here with me. The academy is basically a place that I teach anyone with any background about the scientific inquiry. What what is to do science in real life? You know the thinking method, the scientific method. What you know all the biases, so they can be critics themselves about everything they read. Is critical thinking. So that's what the academy is about. And today. Subject, I think, is a great example about how, how science works. You know, we have little pieces of work of specific people from different groups just adding to the story. I don't know, even remember how many years ago when Dr. Samuel Ramsey published in PNAS the discovery that varroa mites feeds on fat bodies. That was a big boom. And today, I'm always skeptical when things go to the news with that kind of voracity, you know? That creates a lot of waves that for a guy like me, a science educator now, I got a lot of trouble trying to bring people together to convince them that it's, it's not that simple. And I even got hate emails and people pointing fingers in my face. That was a, a humongous, I can't even understand exactly how that works. It, it created a sort of coat around that the subject and we can't talk we can't talk we can't talk if you say anything that's not fat bodies done you're done <laughs> and now you come with a phenomenal publication full of evidence with a lot of well done experiments showing that this conversation is a little more complicated than we thought are you do you agree with my assessment yeah i think i think you know the science Science is a process and it's not a product. And, and so we have to understand that that knowledge evolves over time. And, and in some ways, the best you know, progress is made through some controversies because then you really question the other side. And this critical thinking that you mentioned is really important to not just say X, Y, or, or Z said so. And that's why I believe that it's true, but just I look at the reasoning and, and the data. You know, I, I am, in my heart, I'm an empiricist who does like to do experiments to test a hypothesis. So, you know, typically we have a thought process or a hypothesis, and then we can say, well, if that is true, we can uh, predict that if I change, if I 
tweak this variable on this side, then maybe I can see or should be seeing a change there. And if it's not true, if I find in my experiment that this is not the case, then maybe I have to rethink my theory and or my hypothesis. And, and so that's, I think, a good example here too, that, you know, we, we have, well, in the beginning, we had sort of the common knowledge that bees are feeding on, on hemolymph right? And everybody was believing that. And so that's why the Ramsey paper was so important to say, well, wait a minute, that's not the case at all times. Well, you know, the neglect or the, the, the disconnect between the research findings and then, um, you know, the public understanding in, was that while fat body is, is feeding, fat body feeding is important in the small part of the life cycle that that the Ramsey study addressed. And that's where I think science communicators such as yourself come in and are so important to actually translate that knowledge or or those raw experiments and, and scientific jargon into how it should be interpreted and, and into context, right? And so I think our study is a little bit of that readjusting the perspective and putting uh, the Ramsey finding into a broader context and saying Baroa has a, a whole life cycle at cycles to do different stages. And that's what we need to look at if we really want to understand what Varroa is feeding on throughout its life. And yeah. so again, yeah, it's not black and white, as you say, it is probably, you know, life is complicated and we, our mind works easier in simple classification and yes and no or black and white, but the life and the world doesn't work like that. And so we have to force ourselves to think in more nuances. And maybe this is true, but this could also be true in a different circumstance. I agree. So and can we take a look then? What were your findings then? Because I was I was not shocked. Actually, I always predicted some some hemolymph was there, but not the way you showed. So I'm really, really happy to bring this to the to the eyes of the public now as a as a lesson for all of us about how science works. And it's, there is no criticism at all about Ramesses' work. Actually, you, you're you going to show, I'm sure, that you, you confirm his results, but you yeah. add another layer of data on top of that. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I do uh, want to say that, yeah, this little presentation here I gave at the American Bee Research Conference that was also just held a few weeks now ago. And it is a, just a brief presentation giving you sort of the, the gist of the study the study itself has been published and um, is open access, so everybody can access that um, study in Nature Communications. But yes, so let me share my screen here and go to presentation mode. I don't know whether you can see this slide. Yes, we are seeing very clear. And if you can use your pointer to have some sort of marker, that would be great. Absolutely. I can do that. Oh, interruptions here. These are pointers. So sure. I have my laser pointer here. And so, yeah, I want to start by saying that the the uh, real burden, the most of or all of the practical work was done actually by my Chinese collaborators at the um, Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences and specifically the Institute for Apicultural Research that you see sort of the logo off on the right hand top corner. And I want to particularly mention Associate Professor Bin Han, who has been planning um, and conducting most of the studies and who is the first author of the study. And then also his mentor, Xu Fox Su, who is the leader of the group over there. Um, so this is definitely a collaborative project, and you can see we start here with a slide of uh, the Varroa mite. Um, varroa is, of course, um, very small, and so this is a scanning microscope picture just to show you sort of the details of the body on the back side, the dorsal side, and then the ventral side, how it looks like. Um, and we can compare that to the trochalelops mite, which we, for good measure, also included in this study. And so trochalelops, as you can see here, is very different in body shape than varroa. Um, it has a very elongated body. And uh, again, the back side here or the dorsal side is on the left-hand side, and then the belly side or the ventral side is on the right-hand side. You can also see that they share some commonalities with their legs being these typical parasitic, ectoparasitic legs to hold on to their host organism. I should mention that Tropolilaps is not um, yet uh, moved far out of Asia, but it seems to be on the move and expanding its range. And we are a little bit concerned that it might actually 
um, reach a global distribution just like Varroa. Now, depending on which countries or scientists in countries or beekeepers in different countries you speak to, Atropial elapse is much worse than Varroa, particularly seems to be the case in Thailand, or not that bad at all um, if you talk to, for example, my colleagues in, in China. But still, we have to be vigilant and we don't want to keep it, we keep want to keep it out. We don't want to keep it having to spread over, over the world. For us, it um, provided an interesting comparative data point because it feeds on honeybee brood and exclusively on honeybee brood. Whereas Varroa, as we know, feeds on the adults and also on the brood. And on honeybee brood is, is sort of the reproductive life first, life first stage. Yeah, so just to reiterate, so this was the study published by Samuel Ramsey and a lot of colleagues here in uh, PNAS telling us that our conventional wisdom that they are feeding the blood or the hemolymph of bees is not correct, but that it primarily consumes honeybee fat body, varroa that is. But what the title doesn't mention, and we often just look at the title, is that it is, other study was addressing the adult. And you can see this in this picture here on the, on the bottom left there, where varroa is wedged between the exoskeleton plates of the bee and sort of perfectly fits in there. It makes perfect sense that it sits there and it protects itself from grooming or biting of the bees and can then access the fat body that is just sort of the tissue underneath exoskeleton. And that created, as you said, a lot of press, common press, but also was taken up by, you know, government agencies such as the USDA or ARS that then had on their website, Varroa mites feed on the fat body. And that's so far correct, but then they say, well, of adults and larvae. And and that, you know, is sort of our addition here to this study that maybe on the larvae, on the pupae, fat body is not the primary food source. And they are going to change that. Uh, I've already talked to the people in Tucson. Anyway, so this is sort of the scenario that, yes, on the left-hand side here, and I want to give a big shout-out to Alex Wild, who does fantastic nature photography. But on the left-hand side, basically, we have the adult host. On the right-hand side, we have the pupil host, and they're very different. And so on the left-hand side, in this slide, you see the feeding um, sites that are established on the adult, as Ramsey reported, and we used sort of the same technique same method. We really tried to be uh, in parallel to that study to establish where uh, on the pupil host the varroa mites are feeding. And you can see that on the right-hand side here, these colored circles are preferred feeding sites. And the darker the color, the more feeding there is on a particular site. And it matters because the fat body slowly only develops during pupation. And you can see that from here on the left-hand side, from the white-eyed pupil stage to the dark, almost ready to emerge stage down down here on the bottom right, on the bottom, bottom left, sorry. This is a time series and we dissected sort of this ventral side of, of the abdomen off and stained it for fat body. You can see the fat body stain here in red on the A3, B3, C3 and D3 uh, panel. You can see that the red only very gradually appears and is present in, in significant amounts only at the very end of your patient. And so where the mites are, where Varroa is feeding for the large part, for a large part of their life cycle doesn't have fat body present. And that was sort of the first indication that maybe fat body is not the main food source at the pupil feeding stage. Um, we went then on to parallel uh, the Ramsey study with double staining for hemolymph and fat body. This was a very smart idea to actually feed um, bees two stains that are um, staining in the living organism, and they're staining predominantly fat body uh, in red, which is the color is called Nile red, and, and it's a lipophilic stain. And then on the um, left of that is a hydrophilic stain or a lipophobic stain that doesn't go into the fat, but does stain the hemolymph for any aqueous substance. And therefore, it hemolymph uh, on the second row here, you can see that the hemolymph is stained ye yellow or greenish. And on the third row, the fat body here is stained red. And so what they could show is that Varroa, after parasitizing the adult bees here on the bottom um, row, 
is predominantly stained red, uh, which indicates fat body feeding. This is not, we didn't repeat that uh, result, but we used that methodology to actually ask the same question for when we stain a pupae and then look at the varroa mites. You can see that here in our slide. On the top row is the pupae. We have two um, pupae here. One is stained on the right-hand side and the left one is just a control that hasn't been stained. You can see um, when we filter the light to red, you can see that the Nile red is in the pupae and so is the uranin. The green is also in the pupae. And if you look at it combined, it kind of looks yellowish because green and, and red add up to, to kind of this yellowish tint. And then when we take a look at our protonymphs, deuteronymphs, and adult varroa, you can see that after feeding on these pupae, they are stained a little bit red, but mostly green. And we can quantify that and look at sort of the intensity of these different colors. And this is shown in this graph. Basically, you have on the left-hand side, the pupae. The pupae has a little bit more green than red. You can see that here. These two bars are a little different, okay? But when we compare this to the proto or uh, uh, foundress mites, you can see the green is much, much higher than the red in all three of those stages. And I should point out that this is a logarithmic axis, so that the differences are really quite dramatic. And this indicates that the uh, different life history stages of the mite here during development, but also as an adult foundress, are predominantly feeding on on the uh, hemolymph, sorry, and this is a, a, a mistake in the, in, the, in the title here, for the pupil hosts. So they are feeding on hemolymph and predominantly so, and it's not due to excretion because we also stain the feces and um, the feces stain the very same way as the, as the adult. We went then a step further and looked at uh, proteins, proteins that are identifiable as honeybee proteins. So proteins that are in varroa and that are not completely digested either because they haven't been digested or maybe that the varroa is um, never going to digest. But we can identify these proteins with molecular methods. And we can do this for the foundress mites here in orange and then the dispersing mites in blue. And what we see is that there's a large uh, number of proteins that we can find in both, um, but there are also sets of proteins that are unique to the foundress mite and the dispersal mite. Left is the foundress mite and the right is the dispersing mites. And we can see that oh, there's a lot more unique proteins that we only found in, find in the foundress mites. Oh, there's some that are in the dispersing mites. But most important here is um, that we have from a different study, from a different group, a set of honeybee proteins that have been identified in the hemolymph. The hemolymph proteins are, uh, are indicated here in the darker color. And so what you can see is that the proteins that are unique to the founders mites, there's about three quarters of those are hemolymph identified or associated proteins, and only one quarter is not. In the shared proteins that both founders mites and dispersing mites have, it's about 50-50. And when we look at the proteins that are unique to the dispersing mites, there's actually 60 or two thirds of the proteins are not hemolymph associated, or only one third is hemolymph associated. So that tells us that the founders mites are, first of all, they're different from the dispersing mites on the adults, and that they are feeding on different, presumably, hemolymph proteins. We also looked at these overlapping proteins that are found in both the dispersing and the founders mites and found that most of those proteins were much more common in the founders mites. So the founders mites seem to be having a lot of proteins in their body from the bees, um, which makes sense because they need to produce the eggs and they need to be reproductive, which is mostly a protein metabolism. This includes major royal jelly proteins from the bees and also other storage proteins so-called hexamarins. And in all cases, you can see that these proteins are more common in the foulerous mite than in the dispersing mite. Now, we also looked at the varroa proteins. So not honeybee proteins, but proteins that are synthesized, made by the varroa, and looked at what kind of um, functions these proteins were indicating. You can see that these are numbers or, or words here on the, on the left-hand side are a range of metabolic processes that are indicated in the founders mites and the dispersing mites 
but mostly we see a lot more in the founders mites than in the dispersing mites and we can look at that in a different way here on the right hand side and again um there are things that are upregulated or over abundant in the founderses not so much in the dispersing mites and they uh, relate to a lot of different biological functions that are all telling us these founders mites are a lot more active and well nutri uh, well equipped to be active through the hemolymph feeding. The other technique that we used is to look at not the proteins, but the uh, little small molecules that make up the metabolism. And you can see here, again, this is the details are not that important, but you can see patterns of red and green. And I apologize for those people who have difficulties distinguishing red and green. The important part here is on the left-hand side where there is sort of this clustering and these clusters are indicating similarities. And you can see the clusters are actually according to the food source and not the age of the individual. So it, um, we have a cluster here of the dispersing mites that is most different from all of the other clusters. So the dispersing mites are more different from the founders mites, even though they are the same age, and the founders mites are different from the protonymph or deuteronymph in their metabolism. And we associate that with those three life history stages feeding on the same host tissues, namely the hemolymph. We can look and analyze, again, sort of the dispersal and the founders mite stages and compare them with these small molecules or metabolic markers. What you can see here is, again, that in the founders mites, there's a lot of upregulation. This dashed line here is sort of the, the line of significance or the, the founders boundary line where we say this is telling us something or not. Um, on the left-hand side, we have two dots for the dispersing mites that are above that line. And on the founders mites, we have, you know, about 18 or so. Again, indicating that there's a lot of metabolic processes that are upregulated in the founders mites. For good measure, we did look at tropile labs and we found very similar results. Tropile labs stained, a staining indicated that tropile labs are also uh, mostly hemolymph feeders because they are mostly in stained in green. Again, this is sort of the actual data here where we quantified these stains and you can see the pupae has a little bit more green than red, but the proteronymph, the deuteronymph, and the founders of atropyle labs all have much higher green to red ratios. Uh, and the feces again has also a higher uh, green to red ratio. When we look at the proteins um, for the tropile labs, again, this is sort of this Venn diagram where we have overlap and the green here on the bottom is the uh, tropile labs are the protein, pro tropile labs proteins. And I should say the honeybee proteins that have been found in tropile labs. You can see that there are some that are only found in tropile labs. So tropile labs does have a little bit of a different uh, nutritional niche, um, but there's a lot of overlap. And the overlap is exclusively with the varroa founderses or the shared proteins. There's no overlap uh, between tropile labs and varroa dispersing mites. Again, telling us that there is this distinction of feeding habits between the mites that are feeding on the adults and mites that are feeding on the developing honeybee. And so, yeah, that's basically the conclusion that we conclude from this study that Varroa feeds on the fat body of adult workers during the dispersal stage, as reported by Ramsey, but during the more more important, I would argue, reproductive phase, they are feeding on hemolymph of the developing bees during their reproduction. We also show that hemolymph is a sufficient food source for them to upregulate their metabolism and produce, reproduce. Um, and there is another study from 2023 that also shows that hemolymph can sustain Alvaroa quite well. And then additionally, we show that Trupanilops also feeds on hemolymph. Overall, I think the take-home message here is that food choice is not just driven by nutritional value, but it's also accessibility, quantity, equation, and how much it costs to get to a food source or you know whether you're going to be groomed off or not. And so nutritional value is not the whole thing. Animal behavior typically is a cost-benefit uh, analysis, and, and uh, the bee mites are no exception to that. And uh, with that, you know, I want to thank sort of my group here. That's um, sort of a, a snapshot of our group members on the left-hand side. 
Again, Bin Han on the right hand side there was the leader of this whole practical study, all the practical aspects. Um, and we did have a lot of funders supporting us because science is expensive and um, we couldn't have done it without them. And with that, I think, um, you know, we can end up going into maybe a discussion of, of uh, questions if your readers have some. Thank you, Olaf. Uh, I, let me do some comments here because one of the main challenges to control for all my is to understand the, the life cycle and his completeness. You know, we need to know every single detail of the life cycle so we can try to find ways to intervene. And I think your research add a little bit more of information for all the researchers out there to, to, to understand better this life cycle so we can maybe finally, after 40 years now in the United States at least, to find some way to control varroa mites. And yeah, that's they're all something important. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we're all very worried about, you know, this parasite that does a lot of harm to our bees and, um, you know, the existing tools that we have in our toolbox are uh, going blunt, if you will. Um, they're not the sharpest tools anymore. Um, and so we need, yeah, we need a multitude of approaches to find weak points in the armor or the life cycle of Varroa. And, you know, my lab is doing a lot of other research. So we are actually also developing Varroa sites to see whether we can chemically control Varroa. Uh, I have a student who is looking for viruses. And viruses are, of course, another really big problem for beekeepers and viruses being able to attack and, and compromise the health of honeybees. But in this study, we are actually trying to find viruses that harm Varroa instead of harming the bees. Uh, as sort of a biocontrol method. And then along with Kara Wagner, who we also had on this show already, I know we're also looking at hygienic behavior and, and other natural defenses. And so this is, you know, a multi-tiered approach that, yes, this study was about understanding Varroa life cycle. This was not about a control method. But now that we know better and understand our enemy a little bit better, we can probably you know, come up with other ideas and new um, techniques or tactics to find ways to sustainably control it. Yeah, I am looking forward to see what's going to come next from your lab uh, about potential ways to, to help the bees against Varroa and also tropical labs. That is my prediction that, the, you know, fortunately, these things are moving so fast and people move bees all over the world. It's going gonna, it's gonna to arrive sooner or later. That's my prediction. I hope not. Well, we I should hope all to be, be wrong. We should all be vigilant. But you know, if you if you suspect as a beekeeper that you have tropolilaps in your hive, it's really important to take high quality pictures with a, ideally with a macro lens or something like that, or collect them and send them to an expert because there's a lot of little bugs that run around and that might look like tropolilaps and they're not tropolilaps and they are difficult to distinguish if you just have sort of a blurry uh, video or a shot. But um, you know, things that run around the comb very fast and are small um, and look, you know, elongated should raise some eyebrows. And we, yeah, I agree. We need to be vigilant about it. All right. Thank you for the message. That's very important. We need to be careful about this and send to the experts to a, a very wise identification. Otherwise, become just words in the wind. I want to open the floor for the people at home. If you have some questions, now is the time to talk with Olaf. And if you don't have any, I will be available in the academy this afternoon if you guys want to chat, if you have any other uh, questions about anything else. So if you have some question, please write in the comment session and I will, I will tell, I'll read the, the question to Olaf. Olaf, Anne is asking, the Tropila labs spread the same viruses as Varua do? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I've just had two students in November and December in Thailand to sample bees with tropil labs and bees without tropil labs to address that question. We don't know at the moment um, what kind of viruses are in tropil labs, and uh, it could be, I'm, my prediction is that there is a good, o good amount of overlap because they are taking up the viruses from the bee hosts, but there could also be some unique stories that we just don't know about, and we have just collected the samples uh, over the past few months and are processing those samples in the lab. 
as any other science, it's going to take some time um, because it's just not, you know, very quick to get to the data. Um, these are genomic techniques where we need to send the prepared samples to a sender to get the data back, and that usually takes a few months. Uh, but we should have maybe next year in, you know, in one year, we should have that answer. Fantastic. Anybody else have any questions for Dr. Rupel? All right. I think that's it for today. Olof, I want to thank you very much, for not only for your work and for, for your time here today with us. That's a, that was a pleasure. Yeah, it's my pleasure too. Um, and have a good day. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>